Good morning, folks. Can you hear me all the way in the back? The PA is on? Good. All right. So, hi, everybody. I'm Ken Bingham, and I'm coming to you with about 10 years of working at Amazon and as a system, system administrator and systems engineer, and then five years as a cloud engineer, and now I call myself a developer experience engineer, which I think means that I'm supposed to make it easier and happier for people to use the open source project that I work on. And so NetFoundry is my employer, and they created, uh, with the team that I'm on, the OpenZD networking framework. And so that was what inspired me to start learning about overlay networks, which is the subject of my talk. So I say flexible app networks because flexibility and security are probably the two chief dimensions by which you would measure something like this. And I threw app in there because the networks are app-centric rather than being network-centric. So just a quick poll of the room. Who has already spent some time, some quality time of your own with one of the major overlay alternatives like WireGuard, Teleport, Cloudflare, Tunneler, uh, or any of those? Anybody actually played with any of those or OpenZD itself? WireGuard? OK, so about a fifth of the room has said that they've played with some WireGuard. Uh, WireGuard is an interesting example. and. Uh, certainly really compelling for a lot of use cases because it's already graduated into the Linux kernel. So it is widely available and highly compatible and lets you form uh, software-based VPNs on demand. So that, that was a really a, a good example of a next generation VPN, which is kind of what I'm, how I'm referring to an overlay as like the evolution of a VPN. Where a VPN typically means the, the two major use cases for VPNs that you've probably encountered, just rehashing a little bit. The, uh, there's the case that where you might use a VPN of your own uh, to shelter your network traffic from a presumed hostile <laughs> network at a coffee shop or even your own home network if you're especially careful. And that means, and you might use it in a way like NordVPN or ProtonVPN or something like that to give you some privacy from the circuit itself. And the other would be your employer, the a business case where, or a self-hosting case where you might want to use a VPN to grant remote access to things, sort of a castle and moat analogy where you're protecting some servers and you want to grant remote access to yourself or your uh, compatriots. So what I'm going to talk about today is how networks normally deliver apps. Just a quick recap of that. And we're really looking at this from first principles. We're really looking at this from a, from a zoomed out uh, point of view because I want to challenge some things that you might take for granted as we get into talking about what, what comes next with overlay networks. We'll talk specifically about some advantages of overlay networks. We'll just sort of break down why people care, why you might care about overlay networks, and how they're, how they, what kinds of superpowers they can convey onto the apps that they are delivering. So making a contrast between normal networks, which I'll call underlay networks, and overlay networks. And we'll also get into how a special kind of overlay networks that we can call agentless, which is what I see as the most uh, realistic evolution of overlay networks in implementation form. So if you think of any questions, formulate questions, feel free to just save them up, and we'll um, have plenty of time right at the end just to get everything, get anything answered that comes to mind. So first, let's talk about how applications normally surf on networks. It's kind of a stop-go conundrum because 
Networks are designed to be open. And applications, application operators want their applications to be secure. And that means that if the application has a bias for security and the network has a bias for openness because networks deliver packets, that's what they do. They don't they don't ask for the, they don't ask the packets for they don't grant permission to the packets they just deliver the packets and so because of that conflict of interest there's an inherent tension in the idea of network security and so that's what i mean when i say if we take this back to first principles and look at this uh, if we step back from the problem that's really what, how i see all of the problems of network security arising from that inherent tension. Are we good on the audio? Okay. So applications surf on networks, network security controls, and we might even start putting network security in scare quotes because of that inherent tension, because they don't have any inherent relationship to the applications that they're delivering. Every network security control is a contrivance of some network administrator, some operator, some infrastructure responsible party, some risk owner who wishes to restrict the flow of packets. They want to make it harder for the wrong use cases, the malicious use cases, the abusive use cases. And they want to do that based on a priori knowledge, what they bring to the, uh, their understanding of the application, how it's supposed to look on the wire and how it's supposed to operate. But that infrastructure administrator is not the application developer. They, do not, they cannot have perfect current knowledge of all applications and how they're supposed to operate. So I think I'm seeing some heads nod. You're starting to see what is that inherent tension. There's an, there's an imperfect balance there between trying to control access and grant access. And that's why we have all these anecdotes and all these common refrains about network security and slowing things down to try to speed things up and that sort of thing. So the infrastructure administrator is sort of the linchpin. You know, so much depends upon them, and it's a, it's a very tall order. We're asking them to know a lot about the applications and how they're supposed to operate and to then express that perfectly in the form of configuration on the network. Now let's just assume that they are amazing, that your infrastructure administrator, your sysadmin, your network admin are just incredibly good at what they do. Let's say that they have expressed, they've understood perfectly that application and that they have expressed that configuration to the T. Now you have YAML, infrastructure as code, you've got CI, Jenkins is humming along, and then the developer, what do they do? They develop. Of course, we want them to develop features and fixes, and now the network needs have changed. And that communication, let's say that communication was accomplished perfectly, and this goes on for years in this unrealistic but ideal case. Then somebody gets hit by a bus, or then somebody moves on as they, like they do. Somebody retires. Somebody starts spending less time on the project. Somebody gets burned out. The human is the weakest link and these things break down. So we need something, we need a tighter coupling of the application's needs and the satisfaction of those requirements. And so that's really what overlay networks seek to achieve, is a tighter coupling, to satisfy those requirements inside the, or closer to the application, rather than split, separating those concerns and maintaining that inherent tension between the infrastructure administrator and the developer. So it's kind of a DevOps story where we're bringing, we're marrying the two sides of the house, right? It's, it definitely fits into that mindset. So one other common refrain with network security, I mean, we're seeing millions of dollars, maybe billions of dollars being spent on improving that network security, again, in scare quotes. And what this usually look like, looks like, so the, the route that we're not going down today when we're talking about overlay networks is the route of micro-segmentation, taking traditional VPN and firewall concepts and just making the zones smaller and more specific. That's analogous to what we're doing, but what we're doing is 
fundamentally different because we're actually allowing the developer to express those specific requirements. We're starting with a deny-all policy and allowing the most knowledgeable parties in the stack to express exactly how their application should behave so that it goes, so that it ships with the application. So to begin introducing some of the advantages of an overlay, I'll offer you a metaphor of a pretty nice brick house with a really fancy metal gate. Now, my house, this is not my house, <laughs> but it looks like a nice place to live. And my house does not have a front gate, nor does my community. But if it did, and if my house was invisible, and if you could not look up my name in a public directory to find my address to come knock on my front gate, then you would need a secret map that gets you to my front gate. You would need a pin that is unique to you and only grants you access magically. And that would give you the ability to knock on my front door. And that is what an overlay gives to an application. If turning the key in the front door and walking inside the house is the same as logging in successfully, then in this metaphor, you need a secret map to get to the invisible house and a pen to get in the front gate before you can even knock on the door with an overlay. So there's some shelter in that. There's some meaningful shelter in that. So you're, you might be wondering, what is the association between zero trust and an overlay? Well, zero trust is not a solution. It's not a product. It isn't a project. However, it is, does seem to be everywhere these days. There's a lot of buzz about zero trust. So I'll just recap what I think it is and what uh, CISA thinks it is, which is the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. Yes. And... Zero trust can mean continual authorization. It can mean simply introducing identities instead of addresses as a means of writing policies. So you can see how that moves you one degree closer to being able to more perfectly express the needs of an application in a policy instead of having firewall rules, which are inherently static. To some degree, firewall rules can be programmable but policies are inherently programmable. And when you have policies written for identities, an example of an identity would be a certificate. So if you've got a programmable infrastructure and you're issuing certificates that are exploding certificates, they have an expiration date, and they're for a specific purpose and for a specific time. So if we've gone to that degree, then we have an inherently more flexible authorization scheme than firewall rules and we're basing our authorization on those policies, not on addresses. So that's one definition of zero trust, is simply going to that degree. But I would say that, and CISA seems to agree, in their zero trust maturity model, which is currently in draft form, and they've already closed comments for the current round on this model, but in, co in, in concert with the President of the United States and NIST, the CISA is going to publish a security model, a maturity model rather, for zero trust. So we'll all be hearing even more about it. But this is the way it looks right now in the draft form. Five pillars. So using identity, as I said, is pillar number one. That is the foundational concept of zero trust is that we don't trust network addresses, rather we trust something that's cryptographically verifiable. Pillar two is gonna be device postures. So we're going to add more assurances onto the endpoint. For example, some particular antivirus process is running on that person's Windows computer, therefore the fact that they have an MFA, TOT, a valid TOTP generator uh, seed and they have the correct certificate, we'll let them go ahead and access that service. Example of a device posture, pillar number two. Pillar number three, network isolation. And this is really where the, the next degree of zero trust, uh, as I see it as well, comes in. 
And uh, so it's, it's nice to see some alignment there. But network isolation would, would be the, the analogy with the front gate. You can't even get to the front door to knock unless you're on the overlay. So we've isolated the app, and we've created what you might call an application network. Kind of sounds like an oxymoron. Maybe it is. I'll take the blame. But we'll just go with it for now for the purposes of this talk. So if we, if we, we we're not going to talk too much about the pillars four and five. But I th until we get to the very end, because I think we can sort of see what pillar number four will look like, and we can just mention what CISA thinks pillar number five will look like. So application workload isolation, one, one way of looking at that would be I isolating the application workload itself on the device. That is, creating a trust domain that does not include the rest of the operating system. A very, very small, this is a microscopic trust domain. This means that we're using that, we're building on those same concepts of cryptographic identity so that the process itself doesn't even need to trust other processes on the same device, which is a little bit mind blowing to me as a multi user Linux sysadmin. That doesn't, I, I know that, that that just sounds difficult to achieve. And just briefly, workload data isolation would, refers to architecture of an application in such a way, this is my read of CISA's draft for the maturity model, application architecture such that the data for one customer or one party doesn't commingle with the data of another. And we're, that's the last we're going to say about pillar number five today. Unless you have questions about it, we can speculate. So now we're talking about pillar number three a little bit. So pillar number three was network isolation, like the front gate. And so with, a, with network access of the first degree, <laughs> if we have three degrees, network, host, and application, this will be the first. So a quick visual aid to illustrate the extent of the zero trust. As, this, as we extend this visual aid to the next slide, you'll see it move outward. But right now, the zero trust stops where the local network ends. We've essentially bound together two different local networks with a zero trust bridge between them. And that means that the, what's in the middle there could be the internet. And the, what's on the outsides in the red boxes could be a LAN inside behind a NAT, behind a firewall. And in this scenario, the firewall itself can be, have an extremely simple rule set with zero exceptions because we're using the zero trust to provide ingress at that edge. So there are some advantages to this, even though we want to go further, much further. So this would be the next degree, host access. Let's call it host access. A, d a, a second degree of pillar number three, zero trust, that extends to the device itself. In this, in this scenario, it is the other hosts on the same LAN are not trusted. We, that is, there's no presumed trust of other hosts on the LAN. In the previous slide, every host on the local network has the same level of access. They're using it like a gateway to access other things on other networks. However, here, with host access, each host within that network that has no notion that it's in that network. It only has a notion that it's on the overlay. It's operating, it's applications that are running on it are operating on the overlay. And they have discrete, respective levels of access. Each host has its own level of access, but all the processes on that host have the same level of access. All the users on that host have the same level of access with host access. Lots of words. <laughs> Almost done here. So 
just briefly taking it to the next level, we can extend that same pattern to the application space itself, wherein all of the processes on a given host have their own levels of access. None of them share the access just because they're on the same host. And the difference here is whether the implementation of the overlay is inside the process space versus having configured the operating system of the device. That was host access. But now we're inside the application. And that's accomplished with language bindings. So if you have a Python application, you have Python language bindings for your overlay. And that means that your Python application could be a, a client or a server or both. I guess if it's both, it makes it appear. Any Stargate fans in the house? <laughs> I'm not alone, I'll say that. <laughs> um, it's been a while, right? <laughs> Um, there were some specific advantages that become possible with an overlay besides that, uh, well, just extending the, the metaphor of the front gate analogy. The city of Atlantis and SG, one, SG Atlantis has uh, some really extraordinary defensive capabilities. You can see the, the defensive shield here, which is exactly what you think it is, but it also has a cloaking device, and the entire city can fly. So that's pretty cool. And I thought of this because I was trying to think of a, a, like incredible, incredible stories where you had these, co these combined capabilities of invisibility and portability. So an application on the overlay is both of those things. If we think about that application, which has language bindings for its overlay, it can literally run anywhere. It doesn't need to be on a certain host, and it doesn't need to be on a certain network at all, because it can go anywhere that that overlay can go. So I guess just use your imagination. Maybe you have a Raspberry Pi, and a VPS, and a desktop server, and a colo, and they're all running worker nodes for your Kubernetes cluster. So I don't want to shy away from the chilling implications for forensics of an overlay. I think that uh, just accepting that overlays are happening sort of makes me think it's, it's a bit of an arms race between lowercase security and uppercase security. So what I mean is that all of the tools that uppercase security, capital S security, has at its disposal today for deep packet inspection, port inference, that is that responsible party that I described at the, at the very beginning of the talk that is trying very hard to audit what's on the wire. All of those capabilities, all of that tool chain are basically made, well, they're obviated, they're made irrelevant by the overlay. So that entire tool chain, that entire scope of work has to move onto the overlay to even participate, to have any observability at all. Because as you can see from the blue boxes here, all these top 20 ports that you might want to scan are all port 443, and it's all encrypted. So there's not much visibility for your deep packet inspector, on your, your port mirror, things like that, just don't really apply anymore in this uh, possible future, well, this thing that's happening. You can definitely see that something is happening because packets are flowing, but you can't really infer who the involved parties are, which protocols are speaking, which devices are participating exactly in, in exactly what way. So another advantage of an overlay is that from the application's perspective, everything is a direct flight. There's really nothing that can't talk to something else if it's supposed to. So this introduces the possibility of maybe resurrecting some novel architectures, peer-to-peer -peer architectures, where clients can be servers too, even mobile devices. They don't necessarily have to be, uh, like just imagine how you might build things differently if the, fu if the fundamental topology, if you, had a different, if you had a different tool in your tool, tool bag, 
for a building that includes anything can be a peer, anything can be a server, then it sort of opens up this, uh, this whole world of peer-to-peer -peer architectures. And I do love a direct flight. So uh, this is just another way of thinking about overlays as a flattened logical network where anything can talk if it's supposed to. In the case of host access, there may still be some transparent proxies in there, but you still get that ultimate portability where, where you bring the language bindings into the app itself. So we pretty much covered this, uh, servers can reach clients. Libsodium is an encryption library that is used in a popular messenger called Signal. And I believe WhatsApp also uses this library. And so this has an, a continually modern cipher suite and key exchange algorithms for end-to-end -end encryption. And this makes it very easy for applications, well, for libraries and frameworks like OpenZD to offer end-to-end -end encryption. And what this means is that we've collapsed the trust envelope down to the endpoint itself, because even the intermediaries that are, that are comprised by the overlay network cannot decrypt the payload data. So even though they're on the overlay, we talked about that tool chain for deep packet inspection or auditing the network. Even if you brought those tools onto the overlay, they still would not be able to intercept the payload data of the application itself because it's end-to-end -end encrypted. Just like your messages are guaranteed to be readable only on the two mobile devices that are running Signal, similarly, two endpoints running OpenZD, running any protocol over TCP or UDP, will have end-to-end -end encryption. And the applications that have been either modified or fronted by a proxy are speaking exactly the same language that they normally speak, and they're enjoying end-to-end -end encryption from point to point. Another advantage of an overlay is that you can do some really magical adaptive routing in the middle of the network. This is just to imply a full mesh topology network. So if you think of this having some uh, endpoints dangling off of it, if the perimeter there represents sort of a virtual edge for the overlay, then your endpoints can dangle off of the green nodes. And once they reach this mesh, which is like a backbone, then they can take the optimal path. Even if it looks a little crazy zigzag, it might be going around some internet weather that's causing latency or a loss of availability of a particular circuit. Or maybe the administrator has said, it's paying for the infrastructure, is, has said that you know, node number one there has a, is experiencing a cost surge from the provider. And so we're just going to increase the, the we're going to impose a certain link weight, a certain link cost on that region for that particular cloud provider. And now the traffic will automatically route around it. So you can imagine, even if it is a circuitous path that your traffic is following, that you just don't care because it's always following the least latent path. So now I'm just going to give a few examples of apps that have already been, already been given this treatment. And these are some that we did ourselves with the OpenZD open source project. We took, a, we took a Go library for SSH and added some ZD to it, added a few lines there, and also for SCP. So these are original CLIs that we built using those existing libraries from Go. And whenever we add ZD to something, we usually throw a Z in there as well. So we call it ZSSH and ZSCP, and I don't know how you pronounce that, but that's what we're calling it. And then KubeCuddle and Helm are examples of existing apps that we forked and added a few lines to add the ZD. And now the beauty of these client CLIs is that they can operate on a server that's available on the overlay without any kind of agent, no kind of, no kind of proxy, no kind of tunneler whatsoever, because they have inside the process all of the networking machinery that they need to connect to the overlay. So they just need one additional configuration directive, which would be, where is my identity, my certificate? And they can load that up and present it, and then they're off to the races. 
Another example is just a vanilla browser or any Electron app can have a JavaScript SDK delivered by a web server. And so I'll try to paint a mental picture for you of what this looks like. As a user, you're bringing up a normal web page. You have no idea that you're using ZD. <laughs> and someone has given you, the person who's operating the server has given you a username and password. So what you're actually looking at is a login form for the SDK. And you type in your username and password, and then that SDK running inside of your browser using WebAssembly to accomplish all of the heavy lifting for the cryptography is going to create a private key, request a certificate, use that certificate as a client certificate to present to the edge that I showed with this, uh, this mesh picture right here. Let's say one of those green nodes is the edge that's doing the TLS challenge on behalf of the overlay network. So the SDK running inside the browser now is going to create that reverse TCP tunnel on behalf of your browser so that it can then participate as a full first-class citizen in the overlay. That means the browser can now receive and send over WebSocket channels, secure WebSocket channels, any kind of communication. So that's a, just another primitive that you could use to build things. So one last example of a treatment that's been already been given to open source software is Prometheus. Prometheus is a, a extremely powerful and very popular uh, alumni of the alumnus of the uh, uh, Cloud Native Foundation, um, associated closely with Kubernetes because it's so useful for bringing uh, bringing visibility into a Kubernetes cluster. And one of the basic characteristics of Prometheus is that it likes to collect all of its metrics, it likes to reach out and touch the things that it's monitoring and bring back the data. And I believe there are some alternatives to that for tricky networking scenarios, but that's the preferred mode of operation. And of course, you have an inherent tension there again, because you have one collector, one central repository of metrics and you want to pull in all that data from many, many different places. And of course, those places are distributed. So it creates a hard networking problem where you're trying to grant access to Prometheus to go out and collect all of its metrics, but that stuff is distributed and possibly behind firewalls, right? So instead of a bunch of firewall exceptions, instead of a bunch of NAT traversal, I would suggest try Prometheus with a Z because it can be on the overlay and it can th therefore reach and be reached in both directions, all of the things that it's monitoring. So that's enough about what we've done so far. We're working on our first 1,000 stars. Here's our GitHub address. Would love, uh, shameless plug, would really feel some gratitude if you gave us a star. And that's if you want things like this to exist or if you wanna, if you wanna uh, say thanks. So we also have a friendly forum to give and get help. It's a discourse forum. You can find that going to any of these links that, that I'll tell you about or that you can see or that you can just look up on the web for OpenZD. And every Friday at 11, we have a live OpenZD television, which I often co-host. And that's our change log and demos and that sort of thing. So if you just want to sort of check the temperature and keep track of how things are developing in the space, that would be a good place to go. All right. Questions from you, anybody? Right. Yeah, another technique. So the question is, what about wrappers like uh, that similar that use LD preloads, sort of like T socks or proxy chains, used to uh, socksify, <laughs> that is to provide a transparent proxy, a transparent TCP proxy for vanilla naive apps. Like if you wanted to take a Netcat and connect to something over a socks proxy, but Netcat doesn't implement socks, then you would use something like LD preload with proxy chains or T socks to present that SOC server as a TCP socket, basically a shim that intercepts the system call for the TCP socket. Is that pretty much what you're asking? Yeah. 
So yes, um, so far the tunnelers solve that for us whenever we're doing host access, whenever we're configuring a single device for all the processes and all the users on that device to have access to certain things, then we, it, it creates a, a domain name resolver, a name server, for the authorized domain names. And the IPs that come back from that, there are IP routes on that device for all the major operating systems that get you to your destination on the overlay. So we haven't tried to do it in a, in a process-specific way. That is a transparent proxy that's specific to a process which is what you're describing. Um, but it's certainly possible with either LD preload or eBPF. eBPF is a, like a micro VM that runs in the kernel, and it can do things like, uh, inter it can also act as a shim for a particular process to change the behavior, to change the relationship between a process and the kernel. Yes, you had a question? Jason? So the question is, it, is the application access mesh network, is it riding on top of the existing VPNs, or is it an alternative to the VPNs? Yes. Yes, it's a, it's a much more specific virtual private network that starts with a denial policy. That is, from the administrator's perspective, like where it fits into the pantheon of tools, it is going to be in the virtual private networking bucket. The approach, the programmability, the flexibility of that, the specificity of that is a little bit of, a, of, of an evolution, I would say. Sure, you could, you, I mean, you could basically, basically where the, the VPNs shine, and things like WireGuard shine is the simplicity of a zone-based access control model. You can say all user networks are connect, allowed to connect to all internal infrastructure. You could say that all network administrators are allowed to talk to DevOps. You could say that all of my family members are allowed to talk to my home lab. Things like that are very easy to express, and they don't change all that frequently. They don't change so frequently as to be prohibitive. And then you could have application-specific networks inside of that for things that are more sensitive or perhaps more, more volatile. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. OK. Right, right. Absolutely, for the for the server side, it makes more. It makes uh, that is the the compulsion to use a the, the compelling uh, argument for modifying the app is stronger on the client side. 
I'd say it, it weights in favor of the client because, and, and so your question was why not, why not, uh, why not just leave the, the server app unmodified since you, since you can't protect it from root anyway? And, and I would also add that you know, further, uh, further, further credibility to your argument or to your question is that it's easier to express things like a host-based tunnel or configuration, the thing that's configuring the operating system to have a name server and IP routes. It's easier to express that stuff in a server environment. It's more predictable. You can write the infrastructure as code. You can say, that device shall always have this version or higher of the tunneler. So be it. And it will be so, because SaltStack will make it so, or Puppet, or Chef, or whatever. And that's, it's a little bit harder when your mother-in-law has a tunneler running on her mobile device, and she doesn't understand why she can't connect to the media server. So Z-defying the client app so that it just always works without any configuration and doesn't compete with any other VPNs is a strong case, I'd say. Any other questions? Certainly. Okay, so the question is the question is how does it work, right? And the and the speculation is that perhaps the the payload data itself has a signature on it so that the firewall can recognize it and allow it through. That's not exactly how it works. the The firewall rule is night. The firewall itself is naive to the fact of the overlay. The overlay is just surfing right past it. It's treating it as ordinary outgoing. That is. Incoming or outgoing, but initiated in the outgoing direction I'm on the firewall. Inside, inside the overlay, the, it's all software. So the software is, is, is using protocols, which we call it our edge protocol. We call it the OpenZD edge. And so the edge protocol does exactly what you're describing. It, Ask, so from the perspective of one of those endpoints, let's say it's my, my mobile device here, the edge protocol running on my mobile device will ask the control plane, hello, please give me access to whatever I have access to. And the control plane will, will repeat back, download a manifest into the endpoint, which is just a list of things that you're allowed to talk to. And then if some application running on my mobile device tries to connect to one of those things, then it will build that reverse TCP tunnel out of the firewall back to itself. That means that it can send and receive traffic on for that particular service between the application that asked for it and the server, wherever that is, on the other side of the overlay. It's essentially creating a what link? Peer-to-peer. -peer. Peer -peer. Yes. Yes. So, so <laughs> point to point. OK. Well, remember the. We'll just coin a term underlay to describe a normal network, and the overlay, the relationship there is that on the underlay, you have very simple rule sets for all your firewalls, outgoing only. That's it. End of story. There are no incoming exceptions. And on the overlay, you have policies that allow identities to connect, not addresses. 
Exactly. Yep. Yes. It it does it does underperform under certain cir circumstances, but you get certain assurances as well. So it's all about the reliability and the flexibility of the network. And if you so, I think the the question is, what about the protocols that really shine when you when you when you run them over UDP? Maybe you're thinking about VoIP, or maybe you're thinking about vi video streaming, or something like that. Some protocols don't demand that reliability. Yes, but then the protocols that do demand that reliability are typically performance wide. Mm -hmm. Because let's say secure code for TCP code. Mm -hmm. You know, you have your three way handshake, your SMB, your ACK, right. Well, I can tell you where we're at right now with the with using TCP is that we ha we haven't found anything yet, and I'm sure we will, but we haven't found any because of because of the way it's designed and because of all the assurances that you get with using a TCP based edge protocol we just haven't found anything yet that doesn't work so i'm sure there're going to be real time use cases especially hyper latency sensitive use cases or things that really shine with UDP that aren't going to perform nearly as well and we might not be able to do those things but the question is do they really need the that kind of privacy at the same time if they do then we'll find a way there is a, there are there are certain techniques that work really well to reduce latency. It's just careful architecture and placement of routers. The point though is that you know all those it isn't so much the uh, it is yes. Yeah, and of course there are many unknowns in your speculation about whether or not it would be worthwhile, and we would just need to we would just need to try it. We would just need to see whether the application performs well enough, given those assurances. So I think there are compelling reasons to try to use an overlay as a as a ba as an application architect, and if that breaks down, you know, it's it's pretty easy to find out really early in the design phase whether or not it's going to work. Yeah. Or at least have the option. Yeah, we very well may. We very well may start doing that. There, there is a there is a UDP based transport, which is a counterpart to it's UDP on the wire, but it's counterpart to SCTP and uh, Quick, which you which we're using as a router to router transport protocol. We call it dilithium and transwarp. Window size and MTU. Yeah. Yep. And that's part of the job of the edge. So Richard's comment was that you have all these different TCP tunings, and you can end up with some really degraded performance if you're not aware of that and fi and tuning that along the way for the current network conditions, because the end to end is very important for your window size and MTU. Um, any other acronyms you would throw out in, into that bucket of well, I mean, tunings that are really important? Becomes it becomes a huge latency it's issue from the application. application. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah, we've been problem, we've been very impressed. We've been very impressed with the end-to-end -end performance. That's the edge's job to provide those TCP tunings. So we just work with whatever we find on the device and tune what we can. But you know, having having that window size set uh, appropriately has allowed us to flow, you know, really saturate those links. Yes, sir. Right.
So the question is, how, do you, how are you going to handle that, that inevitable moment when security with a capital S comes knocking on your door and says, well, what about me? <laughs> I've got this tool chain. I've got this title. It's my job. It is my job to, keep, to audit the activity on the wire. So I actually need to have access to that overlay. What does that look like? So of course, it, we're talking about a, an enterprise situation here where there is a security person who is a responsible party. So you're going to say yes, and you're going to absolutely facilitate that. And what it's going to look like is giving them network administrator access and total visibility, uh, at least security read only, that they need to audit everything. So one of the superpowers of an overlay is that every packet is attributable. Every packet is attributable. There are no rogue agents. There can't be. There just, by definition, cannot be anything on the network that doesn't have a certificate. And those certificates have an expiration date. They were issued by a party. They have specific owners, updaters, creators. And so there's all this metadata associated with every packet. And there's a Prometheus monitoring endpoint and an elastic output. So you've got a tremendous amount of data that you can access if you want to. And I think your security guy is going to be very happy. <laughs> right. Right, right. It's a bit of an arms race. Yeah. Right. Yep. So if you were using host access as a hypothetical, your, your question is, although they would have all this information about who's talking on which service, they, can't, they still can't see the payload data itself. So what about that? That's, that's a fair point. Uh, it depends on the implementation. It depends on your level of commitment to seeing that payload data. It's still possible. So if I control the source code enough that I can modify and add the OpenZD Edge into my open source project so that I don't need an agent, I don't need my host to be configured, my process is already configured to use the overlay, then I can do anything else that I want inside of that Edge app to audit the traffic. There's another feature of OpenZD uh, called uh, device postures, and those can also be applied Th those can be applied to any device that's running the host access agent, the, the tunneler. And that's things like I described earlier. This Windows computer is running this particular process ID, which is an antivirus, or this computer has this particular patch. Those, are, those device postures would allow you, and the, you know, those are arbitrary. So you could write scripts that audit the, the posture of that device that guarantee that certain files are present or that a certain process is running or a certain user has certain permissions. So if you had endpoint management software, you could use OpenZD to audit the health of that software. So I mean, that gets you halfway there. I'm trying to put some tools in your tool bag that you might be able to use to, to audit that payload data, but it has to happen on the endpoint. Well, zero trust as a moniker kind of refers to not trusting the network. We can, I think, you know, the maturity model gives us reason to start talking about other degrees. But really where it's coming from is instead of presuming that an, an address is trustworthy because I said so, because I said all RFC 1918 addresses are allowed to talk to this, you know, that's, that's, not, that's non zero trust. Zero trust says no IP addresses have permissions, it has to be an identity. So the, the OpenCD Edge presents the client certificate to the Edge server itself. And so it's standard TLS, mutual TLS. And TLS is the layer on the, uh, yes, on the underlay, mutual TLS provides that Edge bridge for the endpoint to, to begin participating in the overlay. Then the Edge protocol begins to flow 
over the mutual TLS. One last question? Yubikey, yes, we, we support Parsec, and PK, which is a PKCS11 library that works with YubiKey on the Go library. And we also support, um, we have a few different IoT and hardware root of trust kinds of implementations so that that private key that's backing your certificate, backing your identity, does not have to be a file. Yeah, so give us a star and give us a shout and reach out to me if you have any more questions. Feel free to grab me in the hallway if you want to talk more about it. Thanks, everybody.